and infrastructure committee. The specific purpose of this meeting, which I'm currently calling to order, is to address BL 2023-1869. Uh, we will begin today's meeting, I'll go over the agenda briefly. We'll begin today's meeting with a limited public comment period, uh, entertainment, transportation vehicle business entities and stakeholders who are affected by this ordinance will be permitted to speak to this committee. 16 public comment slots will be available for speakers. I believe we currently have 12 people signed up to speak, so there are four slots available for anyone who would like to occupy those slots. Each speaker will be given two minutes, and that's gonna be a hard two minutes. To my right here is Hannah Zeitlin, who is uh, one of our legal counsels at the council office. Uh, because none of the display items are available to let you know where you are in your time, she will hold up a yellow card when you have 30 seconds left in your two minute period. And at the conclusion of your two minutes, then I will let you know it's over and we'll move to the next person. So, uh, after this, and our council staff, Danielle Godin in the back there uh, sitting, she raised her hand. She will help facilitate uh, all the members who have signed up to speak. Uh, after that, we will have a discussion amongst the committee and other council members who showed up. They will be able to ask questions. You may want to remain after your public comment period as council members certainly will be free to ask anyone who's in the audience uh, follow-up questions from the public hearing. Uh, that's the purpose of this meeting so we can deliberate. Uh, we will not be taking a vote today. I have a hard stop at 5.30 p.m. We will try to end the meeting earlier if possible. Without further, does anybody have any questions before we move forward with the public comment period? Okay, thank you. Uh, we will begin with our limited public comment period. And uh, what I would ask you to do is as you come to the public microphone out there, state your first and last name and your address and your business or stakeholder entity and whether or not you are in support or opposition of this bill. All right. Ms. Godin, we can begin with the public comment period. We'll take in support first. You can either. And that's what we usually do if that's easiest for y'all. Go ahead. My name is Jim Schmitz. I'm a downtown resident and co-organizer of Safe Fund Nashville, a community group of downtown residents, business owners, and community members. I live at 305 Church Street. I urge you to support this bill for the sake of all those who live and work in Nashville. Over the past nearly two years, I've attended various Metro government meetings where I've heard countless times that party vehicles don't belong in neighborhoods. On behalf of my 16,000 neighbors downtown, I implore the council, what about our neighborhood? When my family moved downtown in 2015, party vehicles were not the problem they are today. Traffic is a nightmare. Noise and lewdness has disrupted schools and businesses. There are 50,000 non-entertainment workers downtown who have just about had enough of this. The bill you are considering also speaks to necessity. There is no need for, in Nashville, for these party vehicles. They add nothing to the well-being of the taxpaying residents and property owners of Metro. In fact, they pose a future danger to Metro property tax revenues. The congestion and noise these vehicles cause beyond just lower Broadway are leading large employers such as Baker Donaldson, Bassberry, and Pinnacle to move out of downtown's core due to traffic and noise. Party buses are choking our narrow and limited downtown traffic grid. NDOT's own study says the number should be no more than 40. In fact, we don't need them at all. The most discouraging part of the party bus operator's growth is that they have absolutely refused to work with residents and businesses to find a way to coexist. 
exist. They have fought all regulations tooth and nail all along the way. I've been to too many public hearings on this subject and every time the only people speaking on behalf of the party buses are their owners, workers, and vendors. I urge you to give the TLC the authority to limit and continue to regulate these vehicles, if not eliminate them altogether. They are damaging our city and making the financial linchpin of Metro Nashville that is downtown a less desirable place to live and work. That does not bode well for our future. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Good afternoon. Thanks for having us today. Uh, my name is Lisa LeClaire. I reside at 606 Maplewood Lane. Um, I am here today speaking on by behalf of um, the Greater Nashville Hospitality Association. We are in favor of regulations for the ETVs and have been for some time. The amendment to the current regulation allows the TLC additional discretion to limit the number of vehicles. Uh, based on preliminary findings of the Connect Downtown study, the maximum number of ETVs should be somewhere in the 40 to 50 range. Um, I would like to be on record sharing that the rules developed by the TLC have not been fully implemented. Noise, in addition to slowing traffic, are still a major issue. It should be noted that the sightseeing vehicles that do follow the actual rules uh, for sightseeing are really not the problem. They're past Passengers are seated and no alcohol is present. They keep up with traffic and they adhere to all noise regulation. We believe that if all existing rules and regulations were adopted, followed, and enforced, our visitors and residents would feel confident in the safe and fun use of our downtown core. Downtown should be a neighborhood that we can all enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Madder. I'm the operations manager manager at Old Town Trolley, 120 Spence Lane. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Our company understands the importance of limiting the amount of trolley buses and, or I'm sorry, party buses and other loud, slow-moving vehicle traffic in the downtown area, and therefore are in favor of this amendment. However, we do not believe that we or other seated sightseeing seeing tour operators should be included under these same regulations. Unfortunately, the regulations that are currently in place have extended beyond party buses due to the generic definition of 15 or more passengers and greater than 10,000 pounds to qualify as an entertainment transportation vehicle. Since seated sightseeing tours now fall within this regulation, legitimate companies are being forced to comply with the rules meant to eliminate the party buses. We have provided the following list to NDOT and the Transportation Licensing Commission, which would exclude us as well as other seated sightseeing tours from the regulations. We're a transportation system that picks up and drops off guests at sites of interest. Each vehicle we have on the road takes at least 20 cars off of Nashville roads. All seats face forward. No standing is ever allowed in our vehicles. Um, no alcohol is ever permitted. Seating capacity is greater than 40. Gross weight is greater than 30,000 pounds. Our vehicles are licensed to drive on the federal and state highways and interstates across state lines as well. Our tour our route covers at least a 10 mile loop and extends well beyond the uh, downtown core. We are ADA compliant with wheelchair access and our sound system is directed towards our guests with a minimal sound bleed into surrounding areas and we do have a federal DOT number. As you consider giving the Transportation Licensing Commission the authority to lower the number of permits to half or less, please think about how it affects other businesses like ours who are trying to be ambassadors to our great city. We try to keep Nashville's rich history alive while giving our visitors entertainment and transportation options other than drinking on Broadway. While we agree that the loud, slow-moving party vehicles should be limited, actual tour companies should not be penalized by these regulations. We are thankful for your efforts to limit the amount of party buses in Nashville. We are only asking to be excluded or separated from the regulations meant to limit them. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Andrea Arnold with the Nashville Convention and Visitors Corporation at 511th Avenue, Nashville. Um, I'm here to speak to you today in favor of this ordinance, which basically just allows Metro the ability to manage the number of permits needed issued for entertainment transportation vehicles. Our organization is responsible for recruiting visitors to Nashville who ultimately bring a significant economic return to our city. A few years ago, we joined um, several other business organizations to raise the alarm that conditions in downtown were becoming rowdy and particularly unsafe, um, particularly in that fire 
five block, first five block area of Broadway, we were hearing from an increased number of visitors that they loved Nashville, but were starting to feel uneasy in the downtown core. These comments were especially noted from conventions, which traditionally represents about 40% of our visitor mix. Um, many said that it was the large amount of ETVs on the streets as a key reason that they felt that the area had transformed from fun to chaotic, and they felt that the late night party had moved into the streets. The city didn't have an avenue at that time to regulate ATVs as they, um, as they did other businesses. And so to help, we joined other business groups to pass legislation at the state, at the state and with, through this body to allow Metro the authority to create business regulations for these ATVs. The intention was to allow the city to the ability to manage issues related to public safety. Um, ultimately including, this, this ultimately including the deter determining the number of these mobile businesses that were gonna be allowed to operate. It's very similar to the strategy, strategy the city used to manage the scooters. Public safety has always been a top priority. Um, Nashville welcomes around 15 million visitors a year and at some point most make their way downtown. One evening of feeling unsafe will permeate an entire visit. So our city's reputation as being unique and welcoming can quickly evolve to one where people just don't feel comfortable coming here. So we ask you to support this ordinance and our city's efforts to keep Nashville known as a safe, enjoyable, and authentic destination. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate that. Next speaker. Good afternoon to the uh, committee chair and all of the vice chair and committee members. My name is Lisa Haller. I live at 920th Avenue South in the Midtown neighborhood. I am here as, as a Midtown resident, a homeowner, and a concerned citizen to lend my support to the proposed bill 2023-1869. I am a full-time resident of Midtown and have been actively engaged in the ETV conversation for a very long time, attending numerous TLC meetings and speaking before the commission. I also support, as you've heard from others, NDOT's recommendation based on the Connect study to reduce the total number of ETV permits to 30 to 40 to no more than 50, half the number that are currently granted today. There is a group of Midtown residents and businesses working together to address the community's concerns regarding the volume of ETVs on our neighborhood streets and the ensuing impact on traffic congestion and noise. Upwards of 75 ETV complaints, including noise and unlicensed operators in Midtown, have been reported on Hub Nashville just in the last two weeks, 75 complaints. Again, this is only in the Midtown neighborhood. With that in mind, I would like to ask the committee to consider adding noise to the traffic congestion language proposed in the bill. To the degree that ETVs serve a public necessity, the output of plainly audible noise is a public nuisance and detrimental to the quality of life and well-being of Nashville. I would also urge the council to consider adding language regarding complaints. Complaints made by citizens like myself, neighbors and residents, made to Hub Nashville. Thank you, ma'am. That's the end of your time period. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate thank your you. service. Sure. Thank you, for the thank you for your comments. And if there's anything you left out, just uh, send it to us. Uh, or, or you I can have hand sent the letter already, so okay. you all thank have you. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Victoria Payne. I'm a member of the policy team for the Nashville Chamber. We're at 500 11th Avenue South, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, first, we want to thank you for passing previous Metro Council legislation that granted authority to the uh, Transportation Licensing Commission to begin regulations on entertainment transportation vehicles. The Nashville Chamber has a vested interest in promoting the Nashville region and the downtown area as a safe and thriving neighborhood for both businesses, residents, and visitors. Downtown is home to many types of businesses and we are seeing that a lot of our member businesses are finding it more difficult for their employees, their vendors and customers to make it to their business due in part to the creation of some undesirable conditions for safety, traffic congestion and noise by created by the entertainment transportation vehicles. 
We've even seen a few businesses slowly begin to move out of the downtown core, including ourselves, due to the disruption caused by the unbalanced scales tipping towards who play in Nashville instead of those who live and work. We want a beautiful combination of all three, and Nashville has done a really good job historically of combining all three. We will continue to seek input and listen to the community throughout our effort and listening to our business partners, many of, you, of whom you will hear from today. We are supportive of 1869, ask that you consider these operating standards, noting that the aim is to improve safety and many uh, meet the same standards placed on these businesses operating in a similar area. Our downtown area has a long history of diverse constituents living harmoniously, and we submit these solutions in that same spirit. Um, thank you so much for your time and energy on this critical issue. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Next speaker. Good afternoon to the council. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jeanette Barker. I'm representing the Nashville Downtown Partnership today at 154th Avenue North. Uh, the partnership serves as the unified voice of downtown's residents, workers, visitors, and investors. We are in support of this ordinance because it adds clarity that the MTLC has an obligation to first determine a number of vehicles needed to meet the public convenience and necessity standard before granting permits to ensure that it does not exceed that number and that this number can and is likely to change over time. We recognize we need this ordinance to ensure our government can be nimble and make informed decisions that do not punish Nashvillians. <laughs> The current decision-making process of the commission, as guided by law, has resulted in granting 89 permits to legally operate in 2022. This is too many today, and this number would be outright catastrophic in the downtown that is right around the corner. For example, by the end of the decade, residential population will more than double to 36,000. There are four mixed-use projects currently under construction that will deliver three times retail, six times residential, and nine times the office square footage that Fifth and Broadway delivers and the number of downtown hotel rooms will increase by 45% based solely on what's planned or under construction today. No other major city in the country is grappling with sharing urban roads with 100 vehicles that travel less than 13 miles an hour with no vehicle in front that create noise heard from conference rooms and bedrooms 20 stories high and create real safety concerns. There's a theoretical and proven burden for, for any city center, let alone to have these challenges in one of the most visited downtowns in America. We know that the city has been working diligently and fairly to wrap its arms around this unique situation for three years. With one year under our belt of adequate laws to regulate this matter, we can confidently say that the undue burden that we are currently suffering uh, has not been alleviated. We believe this is because the governing body must approach this matter each, uh, each year with a requirement of finding a max number. Thank, Thank you, you for your consideration. Appreciate that. Senior your time, appreciate it. If there's anything you missed, just uh, give it to us and we'll be glad to make it a part of the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you for organizing this, Chair. Uh, I'm Kevin Warner, property owner on 18th Avenue South. Um, I don't believe you're here to debate the merits of entertainment transportation vehicles, but if you'd like somebody else to add to the comments that have been made, I am 100%, 200%, 300% opposed to them operating under any circumstances with the exception, of course, of the sightseeing vehicles and so on. The rest of them, <laughs> they belong on the Las Vegas circus, circus, not the lower Broadway circus that we're struggling with now. So the issue before you tonight is uh, assigning the uh, decision-making authority and responsibility to the uh, Licensing LTC, Billy, I'm sorry, I forget what it is, the licensing. Transportation TL Licensing Commission. Transporta TLC, Transportation Licensing Commission, ably staffed and supported by Mr. Fields. They have been dealing with these issues, the regulations for uh, three years, four years. They are deeply, deeply embedded in all the details relating to what's going on with uh, the various aspects of the regulations. I've witnessed them discuss those in person uh, on the Nashville video broadcast for three years. These guys know this stuff inside and out. So I encourage you as strong as I can to grant them the authority they will need to go ahead and make those decisions on how many permits are issued. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Ms. Godin.
All right. Next speaker. How are you? My, sorry. How are you? My name is Michael Winters. I'm the owner of the Nashville tractor. For most of you, that's the red tractor that you see going around Nashville. Um, obviously, in opposition of this um, recommendation, although I'm not in opposition of regulation, myself and many others have worked with Billy Fields diligently to put regulation together because we believe it is necessary. Very candidly, we just believe this is an overreach based on data that has not actually been presented to anyone. The NDOT study has not been viewed by anyone on the TLC commission who's talking about the cliff notes of the study. So I think the first thing we have to do if we're really going to talk about the study is look at the study. Nobody's seen the work papers. Nobody's seen the study. How can we possibly make recommendations for how many vehicles are supposed to be on the road. Um, the bigger problem we have here is non-licensed vehicles. Someone talked a minute ago about uh, noise complaints in the Gulch. Half of those complaints are coming from vehicles that don't even have permits with the city of Nashville. So we're, we as operators are being lumped into non-permitted operators uh, that are operating on the streets. There's a handful of them that just don't want to get permits and very candidly Mr. Fields in his office has had a challenge in getting these people off the road. Um, there are 87 permits, I believe is the number, about 35 to 34 of those are ET vehicles. Um, one of the things to take note is when they did the renewal process, about 80% of those permits were renewed on the spot because none of those operators had a single violation in a year. No parking tickets, no violations of any kind. 80% of the permit operators are running great businesses. 20% are causing, very candidly, a little bit of problem. The non-permitted -operate, non operators are causing the bigger problem. When we talk about the necessity of Nashville, these vehicles are actually a staple of Nashville. My company, as an example, has ratings higher than every single attraction in Nashville. Our reviews are higher than the Country Music Hall of Fame, Tootsies. Some of the staples of Nashville, we actually rank higher review-wise, people coming to Nashville to do our activities. That's the end of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate um, your time. appreciate that. Next speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Sizemore. Um, <clears throat> I live at 1400 Roselle Parks. Um, I'm in support of regulations, but in opposition of this bill. Uh, I am the founder of Gerard Nashville and TN Transport, which I started in 2012. Nashville's grown a lot over the last 12 years. Uh, alone, our company has done 100, 175,000 riders a year. Um, that's more than some of the Broadway venues in downtown Nashville. A uh, surprising fact that 31% of all of our riders are teens and children. So here at our company, we provide ourse pride ourselves on family-friendly friendly options for travelers and locals. Our jacked-up trucks were listed by TripAdvisor as the number one thing for kids to do in Nashville. Over, <clears throat> over the years, we employed over 2,400 Nashvilleans, 86 total employees this year alone, and have made made large economic contributions. Uh, we purchased land in Nashville with plans of a $28 million facility uh, that will employ over 300 people. Our company is, <clears throat> um, if our company is reduced any more, I have no idea what the future holds for me and my employees. Um, I hope to see that this is a drastic change that will hurt more than it will help. I'd like to say that 98% of our vehicles are tour vehicles with only two ET vehicles on our fleet. I'd like to ask if we could separate the two sightseeing vehicles and entertainment vehicles um, for the necessity of family-friendly options for Nashville. Um, I believe that we haven't seen the traffic study either yet. Um, I believe there's a lot of misinformation out there on what type of vehicle, where is it going, how is it going, routes, and this like this. I think this is something that still needs to be discussed a lot more before you just put the hammer down on, on reducing the fleets in half. Um, a lot of these companies only have one or two permits, but there's a couple of companies that have a larger amount of permits that employ more people. If we reduce them in half, it literally cuts the company in half. And, and that might not hurt someone with just two permits, but it does hurt someone with multiple permits. Um, but um, I'm in, uh, I'm in, but just, oh, sorry. Thank you, sir. That's uh, sorry. your time. Limit. I appreciate your comments. Good afternoon, Scott Sims on behalf of Honky Tonk Party Express. I'd like to thank you all for your service to the council. Honky Tonk uh, opposes the ordinance. Last year, 2002, the TLC cut the number of ETVs from 180 plus to 90. Uh, that's 50 sightseeing and 40 party vehicles. They also took those vehicles off the road during peak traffic times and after 11 p.m. Honky Tonk supports reasonable regulation, but it's clear that the TLC does not like 
uh, the party vehicle form of entertainment. We saw that last year with the overregulation that the Chancery Court uh, has enjoined. In particular, enclosures, which would be the death knell for many operators during warm weather, and liquor liability insurance, for which it was established there's no competitive market. This ordinance, with all due respect, seems like encouragement for the TLC to do more harm, to further reduce already drastically reduced numbers of ETV permits. And we respectfully submit that the focus should be on number one, getting unpermitted operators off the road, and number two, using the regulations already on the books to get rid of shoddy operators. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Holland, I've got you on my list. Do you want to speak? Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Uh, okay. Well, this uh, effectively closes our public comment period. Now we will move to council and committee discussion and deliberation. We, again, as a reminder, we're not gonna take a vote at this committee hearing. What we wanna do is we want to um, talk about this, ask some questions and deliberate, and I will give deference to the committee members, uh, but every, any council member that's here, uh, uh, we certainly wanna hear from you and your questions. I believe we may have a, are you gonna give a presentation? How long? We're gonna have a 10 minute presentation by NDOT uh, prior to this discussion and then we'll, uh, I'll turn it over to allow committee and council discussion. Sal Carn. By way of introduction, we've got Diana Alcarn, the director of NDOT and Brad Fries and Matt Purvis here, all with NDOT. And Billy Fields and the infamous former Metro Circuit Court Clerk Richard Rooker, now a part of NDOT. Uh, we can we can do this. We'll do it. <laughs> Is it working? Yes. Bless you. Let's do start of. Yeah. We'll have to do. Do we won't hold these technical difficulties against your allotted time. We're, just remember, we're transportation specialists. <laughs> not, not, te not technological geniuses. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to give a little bit of overview uh, okay. in preparation for your uh, for your conversation. So, the, we're, I'm going to go through some of the things that we shared with the tra uh, the transportation licensing committee. Yes, sir. Uh, with regard to the traffic. So the first couple of slides I'm gonna show you are actually recent uh, segments. I know that might be a little bit hard to read, but that's actually the section of uh, between First Avenue all the way to the interstate there on Broadway. So I, we really wanted to show you some data, recent data that shows an east-west route uh, through the downtown area, but also a north-south route uh, through the downtown area. This is Broadway. So it kind of shows you, these are the last four years where you can see 
uh, from 2020 to 2023 here, uh, this orange line on this side is 2020. So you can see obviously over time it has gotten worse and it continues to get worse here. This is actually showing you the uh, the afternoon uh, rush hour period of time. And you can see tra traversing that trip when you look at like the 50 percentile, which is technically the average, you're really looking at 13 minutes for that and that is less than a mile. So that's 0.86 miles. Uh, so that is, uh, I don't know how many of you can run uh, a 13 minute mile, but you could run, far <laughs> you could reverse that link on foot faster than you could uh, going through that section during the peak travel period. So that just gives you an idea of, of how gridlocked the situation is during those peak travel periods. Uh, the, the, the next one shows you uh, the uh, Fourth Avenue connection between Wego Central all the way to KVB. So this is important to show this connection because we have future transit developments in that in that area, future uh, transit uh, hub that we're going to be deploying in the south, in the uh, in the. Uh, the Gulch area, so showing showing this is, you see the same thing, this is back to 2022, you can see those last four years and you can see how how traffic is continuing to uh, get worse as re with regard to the travel time. You can see at the 50 percentile, you're at nine minutes and, and over, you know, you get to the 95th percent, uh, percentile, that's the 95th worst travel time. You can see it even goes up to 13 minutes in there and that is only, that's 4,200 feet, that's 0.8 miles. So you can see how the conditions are progressing over time and getting worse. These are these are actually showing you uh, the month of April and May. So I, I figured, you know, we just completed the month of, month of May that we look at these last two months over the last four years to show you some recent data. So that next I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the analysis that we've done. So the analysis was really at a good timing for us because we're in the process of doing the Connect Downtown study. Uh, so we actually have had built or building out this network analysis. This this has been done by uh, KCI. KCI is our consultant doing the analysis as part of Connect Downtown. So we had them do some modeling with uh, with some of the data that they've already have and the volumes that we already have in the system uh, based on uh, present day and, and proposed in the future. So this just shows you the, the network area that we looked in, in our in our and our purpose was really to determine what the impact was of the slow moving vehicles uh, in in the traffic stream and with the numbers and counts. And you'll see some graphs and charts here in a minute uh, that go through here. So so PTV Sim is a micro simulation model. Uh, it's uh, one of the best practices, uh, micro simulations that is used for traffic engineering analysis to study systems. Uh, I heard, you know, I mentioned that we haven't shown the study. Well, this study was really an analysis. You know, we can provide the, the analysis results and that's what some of these graphs actually show the analysis results of, but it also, uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot, of, uh, lot of numbers and a lot of things that we can actually show with regard to what the study actually uh, demonstrated during that. But uh, the best way to make sense of it is really to look at the charts and the graphs that we are gonna show as output of the study here. So we made some assumptions uh, when we were doing the study. Uh, obviously, we can't model every single vehicle in the system. Uh, this PT Visium actually does model, monitor, use, uses uh, traffic behavior uh, analysis uh, with some assumptions for every vehicle in the system. So we couldn't measure every characteristic of every certain vehicle, but we tried to be as representative as possible when we, when we did these, uh, these analysis and looked at the assumptions. So this just shows you what uh, what PT Vism does, you know, it's uh, using ra random number generation probabilities to anticipate driver decisions, traveler speeds, and turn movements. Uh, allows for evaluation of networks rather than just intersections. So the entire downtown network. So uh, ATV operation, we modeled as buses, but that's not the full story. Uh, we modeled them as buses, but we also uh, modeled. Uh, we actually had some site visits in the field where we monitored the startup and loss time 
uh, as a result of some. This is actually the stop and start uh, excel and decel time that, that some of these vehicles uh, have. So we in, entered that into our characteristics and some of the assumptions, max speed was 15 miles an hour. And then uh, we uh, we use two routes per hour per uh, ETV permit, con considering you know they would, you know, be going in and then going out. So two routes per hour. So then we we did the volumes. Uh, we actually were able to attain the volumes from TDOT from a number of data collection stations in there. So uh, we actually. Uh, through some observation, we were able to get a good estimate for PMP volumes and then the, the Friday volumes. Uh, so we these are just list some of the assumptions in there. So 18 scenarios were evaluated. Uh, we can off peak three to 4 p.m. Uh, with no, uh, no ETVs and then we added uh, in 10, 10, 10, 10 segments, 10, 10 vehicle increments, I'm trying to spit that out, sorry, uh, up to 80. Uh, seeing how, what that impact had on the system. And then the Friday off peak uh, from three to 4 p.m. in, in 6.30, uh, 630 uh, to 7.30 p.m. So same thing, no e one, the model that with no ETVs and then you see the 10, uh, the 10 vehicle inc increments added all the way to, uh, to 80. So ran it five times. Uh, these running, running these models, these large models like this does take quite a bit of time. Uh, believe it or not, even with some of the advances that we've had in microprocessing, they still take a lot of time to do some of these uh, high, uh, high density modeling uh, simulations that we put together. So this just shows you what we what we looked at when we were trying to determine what the impact was on the delay of the system and finding where a breakpoint could be uh, with regard to that. So this is the uh, week up, weekday off peak from 3 to 4 p.m. where you can see we have a pretty sizable jump at that 70 range. Uh, you know, you actually have a peak at 50. Uh, then there's some normalization there with the model, but then you see it really take off at, at 70, uh, 70 vehicles and above. And then really, the Friday off peak from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., you see a, the clear break point there at 40. That's where we got the number between 40 and 50, where we can see it take off in, uh, you know, the uh, the upward slope there of the uh, of the average delay that's being added to the system. So this is some observations of the results, uh, adding 80, ATVs from the network results in an average delay increase of approximately eight seconds per vehicle. That's each vehicle on the system. That's not eight seconds total. That's eight seconds per vehicle. So if you times 25,000 vehicles in the system, I mean, that's what that's what your total delay would be in the network. Uh, and then you can see the per vehicle on weekdays and 10 seconds per vehicles on Friday, uh, per vehicle added on Friday. So then the off peak, we saw the PM and in, in PM peak and having ETV start that eight to 10 additional seconds of delay added to the network increased the delay throughout the PMP system. And then you can see the observation that I mentioned on the previous slide, the largest observed increase in delay was between the 40 and 50 ATVs. Therefore, uh, we uh, made the uh, consideration, we made the recommendation uh, that we cons cons should consider between 40 and 50 as the number uh, to cap the ATV vehicles based on that observation. So future conditions and things to consider. Uh, we uh, uh, were not completely done modeling all of our, with all of our work with the Connect Downtown. So there'll be some changes as a result of those. Uh, you know, when we're looking at maximizing the curve space, looking at changes in, in, in laneage with regard to transit lanes and other, other options of the system. So we will have to continue to do this analysis in the future. We expect to do this in the near future and then in preparation for next year, we'll be doing more of these analysis as well. So conditions uh, should be reevaluated re when we're done with some of the improvements that we're going to be doing as a result of the recommendations of Connect Downtown. So that just provides you a little bit of context uh, of our analysis. And we'll be here for any questions, sir. Thank you. I was going to ask if you wouldn't mind sticking around. I appreciate that presentation. And again, just to, by way of reminder, uh, we're going to be allowed to discuss and deliberate this ordinance here today. We will not be voting on a recommendation. Uh, our committee again will meet at the June 6th meeting where we will make our formal recommendation uh, regarding the legislation. So uh, with that, uh, Councilmember Gamble. Thank you, Chair. I have a question about the 
uh, complaints. It was stated during the public hearing that there have been 75 complaints about the entertainment vehicles in the Midtown area over the past two weeks. My question has to do with the uh, enforcement of the entertainment vehicles at this point. Do we know if those complaints are related to permitted or non-permitted uh, vehicles? And, and how often, I mean, with the enforcement piece, how often are we finding that issues are arising with unpermitted vehicles? Um, thank you for that question, Councilmember Gamble. Um, so I would say a majority of the complaints that we're receiving, and these are actually the uh, complaints that are filed through Hub Nashville, are for permitted, and it is for excessive loud noise that folks can hear within their home with windows closed and they're on upper floors. We did receive a couple complaints from folks that are unpermitted. I will also share with you that those folks have been received citations, um, and we are currently taking them through the court system to have them, an injunction put against them and have them removed because we want everyone to play fairly by the rules. And there is a process we have to follow. But I would say um, the, I'm getting complaints from more from the uh, permitted and from the unpermitted because right now we're only aware of three unpermitted vehicles operating um, and most of them are actually permitted and making the noise and creating the issues for the community. You're welcome. As a follow-up to that uh, on the enforcement piece. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, could I ask, uh, do you proactively uh, go after unlicensed vehicles? And would you elaborate on, um, carry us through the process of when you do get somebody operating an unlicensed vehicle and how difficult is it to remove them from the highway? So right now, when we catch someone who's operating and they're operating illegal, there's multiple violations that the citations um, and viol for violations they will receive. And then those violations are actually go before the environmental court and um, to be ruled. We have to have the environmental court actually rule to have them have an injunction put against them, which allows us to, one, if we see them back out there again, arrest them and have them removed from the street. That is about, I will tell you, it's been right now about a 90 day process. It's about a 90 day process as we go through that. And most of the unpermitted vehicles have been actually cited. They have been before the courts. They are actually going through the process and we are waiting on um, the final um, um, reading, but they're, and they're, we're continuing to citing them. So even t even over the weekend, they were cited again for the same thing, Illeg illegally operating, not having the appropriate uh, documentation, not um, uh, serving alcohol illegally because they don't have an, a beer permit. I mean, we go through the whole th gander of it and have the tickets written, but unfortunately we don't have the ability to remove, so we have to go through the, the environmental court system to do that. Same thing for the citations that are written to folks over the weekend that are permitted, they have to go through the environmental court process and we do that. So we are out enforcing. This weekend was actually our first practice of multiple enforcement folks enforcing on the noise level. Um, so we just recently received permission that um, our enforcement could do it outside of our transportation licensing enforcement folks. So now we have our parking folks that are enforcing it as well as our sidewalk folks and they're cross training and they're all doing inci um, citations for every single whether it's parking, whether it's TLC, or whether it's sidewalk. So the enforcement is happening. And I do not have the numbers for how many citations were written over the weekend. I'll have that tomorrow. But I do have and did receive the report for the number of hub complaints that were, were received over the weekend. And it was pretty significant. And as a follow-up regarding the environmental court, we all know how difficult that is when we deal with codes issues in our districts. So uh, when you're bringing these um, statistics that you're talking about with respect to citations, it'd be interesting to know uh, once you identify an unlicensed vehicle, uh, the number of unlicensed vehicles you've identified, whether or not they've been cited versus how many have gone through the 
entire process and have been removed through the environmental court proceedings. So right now we know we have three unlicensed, unpermitted uh, vehicles that are operating. They have all received citations. They're all going through the process. We have one that we expect we'll get a ruling on in two weeks and we're expecting and hoping that that will be favorable and that will be our first unlicensed vehicle that we will remove from the roadway network. So we have yet to remove one. Correct. We've got three that we've identified. Correct, yes okay. sir. Thank you for that. Thank you. Council Member Gannon, you, you okay? Uh, Council Member Cash. Thanks, I wanna stick with that topic for just a little bit um, and really kind of understand what the, what the punishment or citations are, like how much, I'm assuming a citation is not just a, a legal matter, but also a, if they get a fine, mm -hmm. and yes, what's sir. the fine? $50. Um, and that is that $50 a, a citation? Fifty dollars a citation, so they yes, can get endless citations. If Correct. So, hour. for example, if an enforcement officer finds them playing noise that exceeds the the regulation per the TLC at, let's say, twelfth and division, they can receive a citation. Then, if they also catch them over on Demumbrium and, and at Music Row, they can write them another citation. For being out of the zone. Cor well, and aren't the, they supposed to have? If similarly, aren't they supposed to have um, GPS? on the Mr. Field, aren't they, and so that could be another citation if they don't have that. Correct. Is that GPS supposed to be reporting to, like connected to the TLC or some authority? No. Or is it just they have it, it on there and we sure. can check it no. if we want to? Correct, it's for us to actually reference back to. So if we receive a complaint about an injury or something like that, we can actually pull it for records of, um, for research and records like that. But we, we do not get that fed into anything in our office system. So if they go outside of the route that they've been instructed to follow, there's we'd have to eyeball it. That's the only way to know. Well, right now they're not actually, we have not given them a defined route. So that is a, a conversation that the TLC has had, but they have not defined routes yet. Um, so they pretty much can go anywhere they want. Um, but there are regulations such as the noise, which is the largest complaint, um, that they are playing too loud, that it actually becomes a quality of life issue. It's very, it's very disruptive to someone. So if you can imagine, it is quite noisy and loud. Um, um, even with your windows closed. And that's what the biggest complaint is, is like you can be having a dinner party. And I've met with a couple of the office, you know, buildings and attorney law firms, and they're in the middle of these big meetings and they're going down and they hear, you know, Shania Twain's usually the song I'm, I'm being told um, gotcha. being played. And they can hear it coming into this conference room that sits in the middle of the floor on that they're trying to hold a business meeting. So it is really quite disruptive. That's why. Right. TLC put regulations in on the noise and we're having trouble with them actually following through on that and abiding gotcha. by that regulation. But let's go back to the to the routes and like is is this legislation this, this legislation is about uh, uh, a, capping a number giving the TLC authority to cap a number of permits that they give right so the the question I mean like we did this we passed this legislation and I know the TLC needed time to go through it but we passed this like a year and a half ago <laughs> feels like it was a little more than a year and a half ago. it's like it feels like That's it was in October so I guess I'm wondering about these routes or uh, boundaries of where they are or are not supposed to go out here director Alarcon you saying that there are no specific routes but is there any kind of guidance that has any kind of legal uh, ramifications to it about where they can and cannot go. So the only thing we're considering at this point right now is with the Broadway viaduct going under construction and the bridge actually being closed, we have presented um, a route consideration that they all follow during the closure of the bridge so that we can have traffic flow because as Brad had shared, the, the amount of traffic we have on the roadway network and in one given day, we're shutting down a main street that can no longer accept cars. So we have to think about those cars being divided it up on those other small streets and how we can do it. So church is a two-way street, one lane in each direction. Demumbrium is a two-way street, one direction, one one lane in each direction. And now all of a sudden I'm putting 26,000 plus cars on both of those networks. So gotcha. we have introduced a route for the closure of the Broadway Bridge. We're gonna be holding a meeting with the community on that to have conversations and concerns um, that folks will have with that. And then we are asking the TLC to take consideration 
consideration of that, but that would be for the Broadway Bridge. They have not, closure, they have not considered setting routes for the for uh, these folks yet um, because um, there were a lot of other regulations we have to set. And we are, we have been challenged on some of the regulations right now that we are not enforcement, such as the enclosure. And one of the reasons they wanted the enclosure was, of course, because of the noise. And um, so we haven't been successful with that. And then as you heard from one of the gentlemen, the other thing right now that we actually are not enforcing is, is the liquor license require, uh, the the liquor, the excuse me, the, the alcohol uh, liability insurance is the other thing. And that's so those are the two things that we're working through the court system at this moment. I got you. And if I could just add one thing, this ordinance doesn't really talk about a cap. What this ordinance talks about and gives the ability is for our is for the TLC to actually consider changing the number of permits they give. Right. And they do not have the ability to reduce or they, they can always add, but they cannot necessarily reduce the number of permits that they've issued unless they go through a strong disciplinary action. So next year, when we do the analysis and we come to it and we find that we're in the same place or worse place, they would be still renewing it at the same number. This would allow them to consider the opportunity of reducing the number of permits if they wanted to. So it's not given a certain cap. We made a recommendation to staff based on the analysis that we shared with y'all today that they should put a number on it and that's between 40 and 50. Um, they but, did, they're not, but you're saying that they're not able to do that automatically they because, cannot, they've, they, because they've issued that more than that many permits. Permits. Correct. But as permits, um, as a business stops using the permits or as um, disciplinary a action, di disciplinary action, then they can Correct. go down more towards mm -hmm. that. Yes. But, uh, and I want to go back. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll stop after this and come back later if I have, if I have more. But uh, you, I, I kind of asked about routes and boundaries, and you kind of still talked about downtown. And I guess I'm more thinking about like getting outside of you know, the downtown midtown edge and, and even past midtown um, and going up and down residential streets uh, where there's no Disruption. arguable entertainment value whatsoever other than so annoying the, people that right. come out and shake your fist. <laughs> so uh, you're correct. That's so what I'm... Yeah, so, you know, we have as many residents in the downtown core as I have in the midtown area. So if I say, okay, we want you out of the downtown, we're going to put you in midtown, it's still disruptive. If I want you out of midtown, I'll put you downtown, it's still disruptive to the residents. So I, I think really what we're asking is that the folks that have a permit to operate their transportation um, entertainment vehicle, that they follow the regulations that are established. If they turn the noise down and we didn't have these complaints, we probably would not be in this position in this conversation, but they're not doing that. I am consistently every week after a weekend and, you know, beginning on a Wednesday, I hate to say tonight, especially if the weather's good, through Sunday, I'm walking in to a hub report of close to 75 to 100, if not more, you know, complaints, and majority of them are about noise. I would say 90% of them are about noise. I didn't say that. Huh? regardless of where they are. Oh, okay. Thank you. All Brad right. was just correcting me. We do restrict them around schools and hospitals. Thank you. Billy, Billy sent that to Brad to remind me. So thank you, Billy. Oh, yes. Yeah. Councilor Cash, do you have any other questions? I'll let others ask questions, and if we have time, I'll come back. Okay, I've got two more in the queue, but I want to follow up on this question uh, on the statement you made regarding uh, caps, and this ordinance uh, doesn't um, call for caps, or I, I can't remember exactly how you worded it. But what I understand this ordinance does do is it gives the TLC the authority to regulate the number of vehicles, to drop the number of vehicles, and to establish the criteria by which they will use to guide that decision. Is that mm -hmm. not correct? Yes, sir, but it's not necessarily based on a, on a cap or a number. We get, just gave a 
a number based on the analysis that we had done through all of our work of Connect Downtown. Um, so that really, that cap idea actually came from the recommendation that we made, but what they wanted to do was have the ability to reduce the number of permits that they have done. Right now, technic right now they cannot reduce the number of permits. Once they give a permit out, they have to renew it annually. This has given them the ability and the authority to consider it. So if they do have someone who's a consistently violator of noise, not necessarily receiving a lot of citations and stuff, but a violator of noise and they're con uh, con uh, continually doing it, it would allow them to take that into consideration. So that would be some of the criteria is how many complaints they received, how many citations they receive and all of that, that would play into the decision about whether they continue to issue a permit. But technically right now, they would still issue a new permit. Right, because right next now year, they, they do not have that ability. They don't have the authority to reduce. Correct. But this legislation, I want to be clear, this legislation gives them that authority, and it also gives them the authority to establish the criteria yes, to sir. make that decision. Yes, Okay, sir. thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Councilmember Gamble, I go back to you, and then Councilmember Nash, and I, I, I got your hand. Councilmember Bidditt. Thank you, Chair. One other question came to mind. Uh, it was also stated during the public hearing that some companies or businesses have more than one permit. Is there a cap on the number of permits one business can have? And can you give us an idea of, are there a lot of the operators that are operating on multiple permits? Yes, ma'am, there are some of our operators that have more than one permit, so it's really a permit per vehicle. They're given a certificate of, of, of convenience. That's what allows them to operate, and then they're given a permit to operate a vehicle. So we do have a few um, owners that have more than one permit. We have some that only have one permit, and so it does vary um, based on, and that was actually a decision that went through the public hearing process by the by the Transportation License Commission that determined whether it really was a, 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 a convenience and necessity and and um, they determined that number that that particular company would request or requested was really necessary. Okay, so there was an extra step then for the operator to have more than one permit. Correct. We had many folks that uh, applied for permits and did not get all that they requested. So we have a limited number of, of operators that have more than one comp permit. Yes, Do you know about how many of the of the of the fifty? Or, or I mean, of the one hundred. I do not, but I can okay. certainly get that because we have all of that documentation. I just didn't bring it with me. I apologize. No problem. Just trying to get a gauge of how many. When we look at reducing the number of vehicles, how many operators? I mean, if, if ten of the fifty are for one person, that that makes a difference. Right. So just trying really, to understand that. Do you know how many that. operators received a, a certificate of convenience and necessity? I'm going to bring up Mr. Fields for that, please. Thank you. Do I have to hold up my hand? Yes. Uh, I've got to put it up towards your back. Is that better? Yeah. We have 27 yeah. companies that are, that are operators. Uh, there are a total of 90 vehicles that are that are uh, that are permitted at the present time. 50 are seated sightseeing, and 40 are entertainment transportation. So that was 27 operators operating 90 vehicles. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Councilmember Gamble. Councilmember Nash, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's the noise issue, do we regulate the wattage? Yes, that well, the decimal from the noise is what we regulate. I might suggest we might get an audio engineer or somebody to look at the wattage. Okay. Where you can't you that down? produce sound uh, that goes through 20 stories up. Yeah, we'll uh, take a look at that. That's a good point. Um, it's, a, it's, you know, it's the difference between the stereo at your house, it's pushing out 200 watts versus your pocket radio that might have five. Got it. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, the, the other issues, uh, the, there was a point made by one of our speakers about the fact that the uh, purely uh, tourists were just taking you around to show you the Ryman and uh, not being, are we getting, are they generating any complaints? So, uh, the tour, as far as the tourists, I mean, noise is an issue. I would have to say some of the activity that happens on some of the party buses are not what you would consider 
the best um, um, behavior um, of folks. It's almost like uh, folks come here and, and totally forget that they're in somebody else's city and they should behave a little bit better. They're, they're very crude sometimes, I want to say. And um, Was your question relative to sightseeing vehicles, Councilmember Nash? Oh, I'm yeah, I mean, yeah. What kind of complaints are we getting? Yes, I do get complaints from some sightseeing. I was really surprised. With no alcohol. No, no alcohol, uh, nothing. Yeah. Like, for example, I had a complaint over the weekend from one of the sightseeing vehicles about their audio when they're actually uh, doing the tour and sharing out about that actually expanding out as well. So we have, we are reaching out to all of those companies that we received yeah. complaints from over the weekend, sharing with them that we received a complaint, what it was and how many they are at the time, the place, the location. Gotcha. We're documenting that so that they understand we're meaning business. Yeah. And we also did do a lot of citations this weekend. I'm just waiting on that number. Another wattage issue. Yes. Uh, the, um, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, that, from what I... Do we get complaints about them slowing down traffic? Yes, sir. And that's really, the pedal taverns are probably the worst at that. Yeah. Uh, maybe we need to, have we thought about phasing this in? This next year, we're just gonna allow 70. The year after that, we're just gonna allow 50 uh, to give folks a little time maybe to uh, uh, diverse, uh, uh, divest themselves of some of these uh, vehicles uh, in an orderly fashion, um, part of the legislation. So again, our recommendation was based on the analysis we did mm -hmm. and the data that we received and the fact that we hit a critical point. So when even though Brad shared two graphs with you, one was weekdays and one was weekends, we take the most critical one, which would be the weekend one, which was 40. Yeah. So that's why our recommendation was actually, if you're gonna consider giving any permits, you should only maximize 40 because once 40 is in the field, it starts slowing down traffic that we're getting worse numbers that are cumulative so oh. it sometimes yeah. takes someone more than 13 minutes to move a mile. That is really crazy. I agree. And so, um, and but again, Connect Downtown was looking at a lot of different things. So that's why we left flexibility in there to allow us to do analysis. There are some other things we can do to improve traffic flow that we're going to take into consideration once we get done with Connect Downtown. That when we do the analysis, it may say eh, you can have more, or it may be analysis says actually it should be less because we have more cars that are now in the downtown core yeah, so the, it's something we wanted to have flexibility on an annual basis for consideration for the for the for the TLC to consider based on the actual data of what's happening in the field well I, I continue to be uh, concerned about the growth that we we're that was uh, projected for that area it's not going to get better it's going to get get worse I think and so I think we really need to be thinking about some forward-thinking steps uh, as we go for uh, look at this issue Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Nash, Councilmember Benedict. Thank you, recognized. You. Thank you, Chair. Especially since I'm not on this committee, I appreciate the opportunity to ask some questions. Thank you for coming. So um, I will just say, um, probably half of District Seven it would be the suburbs, and I would consider Inglewood and Madison suburban as compared to South Inglewood, for instance, where it's more urban. And I will say that throughout the district, folks are you know looking for things to become more urban in that area because they don't want to go downtown. Frequently I hear from people that it's too difficult to go downtown, it's not their um, the quality of life that they're looking for when they go places. And I will say personally, some of the comments just made in regards to, um, I've seen vulgar things on some of these buses myself being downtown. And so I concur with those constituents of mine who don't want to go downtown. And that's unfortunate because it's our city, right? And there's a lot of amenities down there. I was looking and it looks like there's, and I don't know if anybody from planning or if uh, someone can confirm, it looks like there's 23,000 people in the downtown district and 13,000 households. Yeah. Is that about right? That sounds about right. Okay. Um, and that, and then of course the businesses that operate down there, schools mm -hmm. and churches too. Um, two questions. One, what is, and I think this might be under Connect Downtown, but what is the vision for potentially closing streets to all vehicular traffic? 
Um, so th that is something that is being considered and looked at through Connect Downtown. We have not gotten all of that information back yet. Um, it would be if it was if it was going to be a recommendation. That's again something we would take back to the to the public for consideration. And and I know there would have to be partnership with Tdot because Broadway is a state route, etc. So I know that there would be a lot there. I just didn't know if there was any type of a vision so for that, like other cities that have such a robust downtown to help make it safer for pedestrians in particular, right. as well as potentially put in multimodal uses for bikes and scooters, special, specific lanes for buses. I've been down there and chosen to walk instead of ride and maneuver, so or lift. So you and know, I get the the traffic congestion piece. And that's everything that Connect Downtown is looking at. Okay, thank you. And then I guess I, I just want to clarify. It sounds like the rub currently is that no permits are being revoked, but the rub is that nobody can expand the number of permits. So um, the this right now the. TLC has issued 90 permits. And so without the ordinance, they would have to renew those 90 permits unless there is a true disciplinary action that comes into place. Um, and then that would be the way to, to actually uh, revoke a permit and take it back, which the TLC does have that authority. This gives them the ability to set criteria in which they would say, yeah, no, you had, you know, 15 or 20, you know, complaints that came in from the community from you, you received five citations, therefore we are not renewing your citation. And that's why um, Council Member Pulley, the chair, had mentioned about setting criteria. They have no ability to do that today, and that's what this ordinance is allowing them to do. It's giving them that opportunity so that we get the businesses to be better neighbors and better players than what they are today. Thank you. And so one final question, and I, I, I don't mean this tongue in cheek, I mean it literally like what can be done in regards to improving sound for residents. At the Speedway, there's a proposed buffer that's going to be put in place, are there, and that's going to retain the noise in that area. Is there anything that we could do to somehow keep noise retained. Obviously, I know that there's residences above the bars and around the bars downtown, but is there any way that we can do something to hold the noise a bit more in the party or entertainment <laughs> district? So um, one of the things that was that is actually in the regulation but is currently being challenged right now in the court system is to have the buses actually, the party vehicles actually enclosed so that the sound would stay in. And uh, they, uh, there was actually um, in the court system, uh, the concern was it would make it too hot in the vehicles that it, or it would almost make it, it would make it too hot where they would not even be able to be in business. So there is that conversation that's going on but that's currently going through the court system. So we are not able We've gotten an injunction against us to not be able to enforce the enclosure. So that's why they're all operating with the with it open and, and we're having the problem with the noise. Thank you for that. I have a follow-up. I just got confused on that. So there's buses that are enclosed that can't be air conditioned. I've not been on an, I mean, anytime I'm on a bus, um, it's air conditioned. So I just, I guess I'm trying to understand, are these vehicles unable to be air conditioned? Is that what's going on in the court case? Yes, the, 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 I, I don't, I'm, I can't speak to it legally because it's in the courts, but that is one of their arguments is they were originally designed without air condition to now design them with air condition would be cost prohibited. Ah, okay, understood. Thank you, and thank you again, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Benedict. Councilmember Cash. Thanks. I want to make sure um, I understand what it, we're talking about here in terms of the numbers and the types of vehicles, because Director Alcorn, you brought up at one point pedal taverns. Is that is that part of what we're looking at here? Because I mean, we hate pedal. I know pedal taverns was dealt with last last term, and there was a, a some rules set forth and some and some um, boundaries made. But then we were, but then some of the uh, motorized vehicles started coming up, and we were told by the state that there was limit, there were limits on how we could enforce them. So I want to make sure I am understanding that what we've been talking about, especially in terms of data and numbers of permits and stuff like that, are we talking about motorized ETVs or and is pedal taverns a separate category from that? So when we did the modeling. 
One of the criteria that was put in, we modeled them as buses, that was one thing, but we also modeled everything at a maximum speed of 15 miles per hour. The model cannot tell the difference between whether it's a pedal tavern that's moving below 15 miles per hour or if it's a bus that's moving at 15 miles per hour because a pedal tavern's pretty big and when you are doing it by the bus, you're not doing it by, you're actually, they're taking like even a smaller bus. So. Yep. We, when we're considering this number, we're looking at that number and that 40 that hit, and we're going, it's including pedal taverns. It's including everything that moves slow, which is the sightseeing tour, because they do move at a slower rate. It is including the entertainment um, buses, and it is including the pedal taverns. So our magic number is 40 to help with not creating the gridlock in the downtown core. 40 of all those yes. types of, so when you say we're at 90 right now, Correct. that includes uh, pedal taverns, nope. to, okay. You have to add 23 to that. We have 23 uh, permits out on pedal taverns. So you add 90 to that, we're at 113, and then we have five permits, right? Five out on the horse and carriage? Uh, two, uh, two, yeah, two companies and five nine. permits out, huh? Sorry, two permits and nine. Permits. Nine permits. So that's, if I just do my quick math, that's 113 plus nine. We're at 222 permits of slow moving, um, what we're calling. 122. 200, yeah, 122. What did I say? 222? Yeah. 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 222. No, I'm sorry. It's 122. Uh, <laughs> and there was something else. Um, and the, the, the boundaries that were created la for pedal taverns that were created last term, those still stand. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, and I just want to make a comment about the, like, I get that, I mean, my understanding is some of it, when we passed the law and the TLC came up with, and, and we said in close, and the TLC kind of set some rules to back that up. I mean, some of the vehicles were, were put up, these kind of things were put up, right? And it was kind of rigged to, to, make, to make, to meet the law, but it wasn't necessarily a, an enclosed type of vehicle traditionally. Is that is that fair? No. Is it something like this, or is it really no, more? No, actually, the the point behind the enclosure was to retain the noise right. inside the vehicle. So if they put a plexiglass and that did it, it met the regulations. That's what we would be um, actually um, looking to find. Right. Um, but, but, they, but they didn't, and, and they do close during the winter. So I mean, I don't know if you're out there, the, a lot of those vehicles are actually enclosed in the winter. But again, the temperatures are different. It's, I guess, can be managed in the winter with it enclosed, but in the summer, their concern has been that it is um, not feasible to have it enclosed, and therefore, if we were to require that and that was to go through and we were to regulate that, it would then put a lot, take a lot of the buses off of the road. That is their, I, their, their concern. Right. I get that. I mean, we got kind of like got three elements here, and we, I guess a fourth could be the, the sheer number, the volume of them that we're kind of talking about here, but there are three that seem to be integral to this type of business. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but... Um, they're on a public street, they involve drinking alcohol, and they're, they're, that, that includes noise, which it could be woohooing or, or music. And you know, the, the three of those things together are going to cause problems. And it seems to me that out of those three, wh while I hear the gentleman saying that, uh, the, and, and you seem to say others, that the enclosure is kind of a death knell to the, to the business, I think, is it not true that they would probably say the same thing about the other two on on public streets and involving drinking alcohol? I, I mean, it, it seems like the enclosure is the one of those three that uh, part of the business model that could be addressed the, the easiest without getting rid of one of the others. But I think when we have those three, I mean, I, I it, it, like I feel for anybody that is going to, you know, it's going to damage their business. But on the other hand, these are public streets and it's it's a bar moving down a public street with, with people that are out in the open and it's, it's, it's just going to cause problems. Uh, so I appreciate you all tackling, tackling these issues and, and trying to make it work without um, overly impacting the downtown 
the downtown area and especially the, the streets. Thank you. Thank you. I have one clarifying, uh, I want to clarify some of the things that Councilmember Cash said, just to be clear. Um, you said in your study that your model doesn't break down what's what. So would you say that pedal taverns, carriages, and sightseeing vehicles were all included in this because you couldn't tell the difference between one and the other? It just models slow moving vehicles. It just all, it, that's right, just slow moving but vehicles. But it does also model buses, but the pedal caverns are pretty are pretty big, so okay. maybe we could exclude the horse and buggies because those are not going to really fall in it. But it, it really walk. did. I mean, we modeled 15 miles per hour, so anything that moved below a 15 mile per hour speed, that was really the big thing. And the only other clarifying question I have for you is just to get these numbers straight. Um, you had 90 permits issued. What's the breakdown of those 90 between sightseeing vehicles and ETVs? It's, uh, yeah, 50 is for the sightseeing and 40 is for the um, entertainment vehicles. And 23 pedal taverns. Yes, sir. And nine horse carriages. Yes, sir. Which uh, add up to 122. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other council members have any questions? Seeing none, I do want to thank everyone from uh, the public who came to speak. We really appreciate your time and we thank you for your comments and uh, we take those to heart. Uh, they mean a lot to us and uh, that's one of the reasons why we called this meeting. We wanted to hear from you. So don't think this is just a wasted effort on your part. We really appreciate you coming out here and we will consider your comments as we further deliberate this bill. Uh, with no other business, I thank you all for attendance. We are now adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.